right, thank you. Again, my name is Angie West. Um, I'm currently at the Stedman Clinic in Vail, Colorado. Um, so thank you, uh, New Orleans, for all the humidity and heat. It's a nice break because it's snowing there now. All right, so Grant's teed us up nicely, and at this point you can pretty much assume that you have an athlete with an anterior shoulder dislocation. Now you need to rule out concomitant injuries that would preclude you from performing a, um, a reduction on field. Those would include crepitus and instability and ecchymosis over the humeral head, neck, or shaft, which could indicate a fracture. Also a clavicle fracture, posterior dislocation, Luxatio erecta, which is an inferior dislocation, and a C-spine injury. So I'm going to give you an algorithm that you can approach the situation with a systematic thought in your head. All right, you have a shoulder dislocation. You assess whether it's anterior, posterior, or inferior. If you have a posterior or inferior dislocation, we'd recommend that you assess the situation, uh, neurovascular compromise, immobilize the patient, and refer them immediately to the emergency department. If you have an anterior dislocation, you're going to further um, evaluate the age of the patient. If they're over the age of 40, we would recommend that you assess, immobilize, and refer to the emergency department because of the likelihood of a significantly, uh, or clinically significant fracture. If they're under the age of 40, you're going to further evaluate their neurovascular compromise. If there's any sort of neurovascular compromise, we would recommend that you first give one attempt, um, and then after that, whether or not uh, they are reduced, you would recess, immobilize, and send to the emergency department. If, if uh, they are neurovascular intact after your evaluation, Give two attempts if pain, if pain is uh, permitting you to. And then if they're not uh, reduced, recess, immobilize, and send to the emergency department. If you do get them uh, back into the joint, recess, immobilize, and then if uh, by some slim chance that they have developed a neurovascular compromise, we would recommend that you send them to the emergency department. If like 99% uh, shoulders after you reduce them, uh, neurovascular symptoms uh, are decreased, uh, we would recommend that you have your patient follow up with a, an orthopedic uh, doctor as soon as they can. So why do we recommend that athletic trainers reduce on the field? Well, uh, you are going to minimize the progression of the injury by minimizing the amount of stress you pl are placing on the soft tissue and the neurovascular structures, as well as minimizing the muscle spasms uh, for the patient, which will make it more difficult for the clinician to put the shoulder back into joint. Also, for the patient's sake, you're, uh, you're decreasing the amount of money that could cost your patient, and some of your athletes may or may not have insurance. An emergency department visit can cost upwards of $8,000, depending on uh, what they have to do there, if they have to do open versus closed reduction, uh, sedation versus anesthesia. Also, the amount of time you could spend getting to the emergency department and the amount of time you're going to spend at the emergency department, as well as, of course, minimizing the pain for your patient. So in the best case scenario, you get to an, a shoulder dislocation. You're going to get consent to treat from the patient. Uh, take the patient to the sports medicine facility, which is a little bit better than on the sidelines. You have better equipment, less distractions from coaches, other players, parents possibly. You have a, the appropriate equipment available to you. You get the patient to relax uh, as best as you can. And then choose one of the techniques we're going to give you today, uh, which are uh, safe and easy to use. And then hopefully get that early reduction. So when you're going to choose your method, I'm going to give you a bunch of techniques that are safe and have the highest, uh, highest percentage of um, success. They're essentially tools you're going to put in your toolbox. Now it's up to you which tool you pick that day. It's going to depend on where you are. Um, are you on an athletic field that's a remote location? Are you really close to your athletic training facility where you can bring the patient inside? Or are you the only one covering a multi-sport day? How much equipment do you have available to you? What kind of table, uh, traction utility, uh, utensils, and also personnel? Who do you have there to help you uh, with this patient? How large is the patient that you might need some help? Do you trust your coaches, your student athletic trainers, or support staff? 
Um, also the patient history, you know, is that, have you seen this patient once a month for this shoulder dislocation or is this the first time that they have dislocated their shoulders in which, in which point they might be a little bit more um, afraid of the reduction process. Unfortunately, all the evidence to support um, what I'm going to present to you, that all the studies were um, done in hospital settings and emergency departments, uh, usually with residents performing the reduction. So there isn't um, research on on-field management yet. So the first and probably uh, most widely and historically reported on method is the Hippocratic method, where you stick your Nike and or leopard print flat in the axilla of your patient and pull very hard. <laughs> it was a poor shoe choice that day. Um, <laughs> so you can see that after Grant had reported on the neurovascular structures involved in the shoulder joint that you know this might damage them or, or at least put more pressure on than is actually needed. So I'm going to give you some better tools to put in your toolbox. The first technique we're going to talk about is the milch technique. You're going to lie the patient uh, supine on the table, and either actively or passively, the, the patient is going to put their hand behind their head. At that point, um, the clinician is going to place one hand over the affected glenohumeral joint and the other supporting uh, the rest of the arm and push down in posterior force. Uh, this uh, method has um, reported a 72 to 89% success rate. So you can see in the video, I'm uh, providing a posterior force, nice and gentle. The theory behind this method is that you're placing the soft tissue musculature in such a position that it's not inhibiting your ability to put posterior force in the shoulder. The next method is the external rotation method. Again, the patient slides supine. You flex the elbow to 90 degrees and forward flex the shoulder to approximately 20 degrees. Then you slowly externally rotate the shoulder uh, and uh, definitely you need to support the shoulder a lot in order to allow the patient to relax. And uh, it's typically uh, reduced around 70 to 110 degrees of external rotation and has a high first attempt success rate at 89%. See, the shoulder is well supported and coming out in an external rotation, and the patient looks very comfortable. Um, the next method um, is also widely used in sports medicine. Although there's not a whole lot of data to support this method, uh, it is a good option for you to put in your toolbox, um, is the counter-traction, traction counter -traction method. It does require two clinicians and also a long towel or sheet, uh, so make sure you have those available to you. The patient lies supine with a sheet wrapped around the body. It is helpful if you put it into the axilla so that when the counter-traction is applied, there's actually uh, force coming onto the scapula. The patient's arm is placed in the 90-90 degree of, uh, position of abduction and external rotation. And then uh, the first clinician pulls the sheet away from the extract, uh, affected extremity. And the other clinician supports the arm and does gentle oscillations into external rotation. Uh, also, if the patient is larger, you can wrap a sheet around the person's waist that has the affected extremity and around the patient's arm and really lay back into it and use your body weight to create some gentle traction while you're oscillating the shoulder. So bring it out to 90-90 position, force applied both directions, and oscillation. Of course, it may take a little bit longer than these videos are showing, um, but just be patient and um, definitely keep your cool. Uh, the next method is scapular manipulation technique. Uh, it's very gentle. You're going to lay the patient prone. You will have to have something in order to create traction. Uh, up to 15 pounds is applied to the patient's wrist, uh, depending on what you have available to you. Obviously, you're not going to use a 15-pound weight on one of your cross-country athletes, especially the women are very tiny. Uh, so pick something that's appropriate to the patient. Uh, 
then you uh, apply the weight to the uh, wrist of the patient on the affected extremity, find the inferior border of the scapula, and uh, rotate it. It has a 99 or 92 percent success rate, uh, and so it's very gentle and effective. We fortunately had, you know, obviously those weights with the Velcro, but you can be creative in your athletic training room. You see my hands are positioned over the inferior border, or inferior angle, excuse me, and I've rotated it. Sometimes you may want to let the arm hang like that with the weight and traction, let the muscles relax before you add in the scapular manipulation. Last technique is the simplest, uh, the most effective, and the one that we would recommend because it doesn't take much and anyone can use it. You just have to be there to monitor the patient. It's called the Stimson or hanging arm method. The patient lines, lies prone with, slight, with a slight abducted arm over the table. Add the, um, the weight to the wrist of the affected extremity and then simply let the patient relax and hang there. It has a 96% success rate, um, also in com combination with the scapular man manipulation technique. The theory behind this method is that by letting them hang in this prone position with the weight, uh, the muscles will eventually fatigue, the spasming muscles will fatigue and allow for that traction to um, continue into reduction of the shoulder. You can also add slight external rotation at the forearm and hand to aid in the reduction, which I am doing there. So this is a video that was taken in our emergency department, Vail, Colorado. Uh, this is a patient. You can see that he has a defect. You can see the chromium process right there. And here's the ER doctor trying to get him as comfortable as possible. I'm fairly certain we had to edit out the sound of this just for language used by the patient, although he does look really comfortable. And this is going to be an example of how you can take the tools and really use them in a way that makes you comfortable. She's going to start with a little bit of external rotation method, and then she will also add in a second clinician and do um, a little bit of modified traction counter traction. So she's really supporting that arm. She's putting a little bit of traction on there. The second clinician comes in and holds the scapula. If you pay attention, uh, after a few seconds here, you'll see the shoulder go back into joint. So you do have to be patient. So we would call that one attempt. That was a progression through the range of, range of motion into the technique that she wanted to use. And, and uh, as you can see, you do have to be a little bit patient. So you've reduced the shoulder. First try. Good job, everybody. Now, what do you do with the patient? Well, of course, you reassess the neurovascular structures, assess the range of motion and strength, Immobilize, document, write yourself an excellent SOAP note, and uh, possibly refer for diagnostics. But the most important one we're going to discuss today is mobilization. To immobilize or not, what position and for how long? Those are the questions that are being asked right now in the literature. The concerns are that there's a lack of high-level evidence to support any recommendation. There's conflicting data and irreproducible findings. The theory behind external rotation, which was first brought to light by Ito et al., is that in this external rotated position, uh, the bank heart lesion is better approximated uh, because it's in a more anatomical position. Also tightens up the anterior soft tissue. So that's an example of this sling. And then you can see an example of the uh, normal internal rotation sling that most athletic training rooms are equipped with. Uh, the theory behind length of immobilization is that longer you mobilize somebody, immobilize somebody uh, the more time the soft tissue has to heal. Um, although there's conflicting recommendations anywhere from don't, it doesn't matter if you immobilize to eight weeks of immobilization. 
So these are papers that were included in a meta-analysis by Patterson et al. On the bottom you see these are uh, three papers that look, the three best evidence papers that look at position of immobilization. The top are the best papers that look at length of time to immobilize an individual. And these studies look at how age affects the amount of time you immobilize a patient. Basically, to sum it up, uh, Ito et al. found that external rotation significantly decreased recurrence. Although when you look at the meta-analysis and other papers that were published, uh, these are irreproduci irreproducible findings. And when you look at how long to immobilize, there hasn't been anything that I can just tell you, this is how long. It's not a gray area. So there are some trends towards longer mobilization, but nothing has been statistically significant. The big, the big problems with these studies are that there's problems with heterogeneity and age cultural bias. All the Itoi patients were from Japan, um, and then the age of the patients included in the studies were anywhere from 17 to 80, which does affect uh, the outcomes. Recreational habits, whether they're military-based uh, papers, which were included. Also compliance, irreproducible findings, and outcome measurements. Uh, just recurrent dislocations alone might not be enough to capture um, continued instability. We have to go with subluxations or just activity modifications as well. So the take home message is, it doesn't matter how long or in what position you immobilize somebody, that if they're under the age of 30, they're more likely to dislocate their shoulder in the future. So that's why we recommend that you immobilize the patient and then send them to an orthopedic doctor to further make the decision from there what the next step in treatment is going to be.